Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to this beautiful spring day in Waterloo and to Conrad Grable University College. Today and tomorrow marks an extended convocation weekend honoring the graduating class of 2014 as part of our 50th anniversary celebrations. I am Susan Schultz Huxman, president of the college, and on behalf of my faculty and colleagues, we are glad you are here for a special lecture featuring an international pop star of sorts in peace building, Dr. John Paul Lederach of uh, the University of Notre Dame. As many of you know, for the past nine months, since August of 2013, we have been making a big deal out of the fact that Grable is golden. 50 years ago, in 1963, 1964, many bold and brazen Mennonite visionaries saw promise and possibility in accepting the invitation from Waterloo to start an Anabaptist-inspired liberal arts college along the sandy banks here of West Mount Road, across the creek from, and affiliated with the upstart Innovative Engineering School at Waterloo. To commemorate that wild and wonderful beginning of this place we now inherit, we have been staging 50 events to remember 50 years. This event is number 45. And only Fred and Jen and I know that particularly deep in our bones, don't we? We're going to make it to 50. Uh, back, back in the fall, we really wanted to highlight a scholarly academic event as part of our 50th celebrations. And so we lighted on the idea of bestowing the college's first honorary doctorate degree. Though we are not a separate degree-granting institution at Conrad Grable, our provincial legislation recognizes our right to confer an honorary doctorate of divinity degree. And so we formed an honorary doctorate committee to look at a long list of worthy recipients who were nominated for this first award. John Paul Lederach soon rose to the top as a fabulous representative of the mission identity and core values of the college, and as one who has established an international reputation in the scholarship and practice of peace building. So John Paul Lederach will be bringing the convocation address and will be honored with a doctorate of divinity degree tomorrow at convocation ceremonies. But being good Mennonites, we didn't want to just fly him in here to receive an award. We need to put him to work. And so today has been a full day of meals, conversations, and workshops with faculty, staff, community partners, and students. And tonight, we bring you a public lecture in order to share with you our many supporters of the college. John Paul Lederach, being a good Mennonite, understands these things and has graciously agreed to share his expertise for this extended period of time. Just a word on logistics. After the lecture, we will proceed immediately to the atrium for a reception, which uh, for many of you, you'll be glad to know, is in much better shape than it has been in, in recent iterations of lectures from the Great Hall. We are very, very close to completion of our construction process, and I want to put out a, a shout out now to, to mark your calendars to join us for June 22nd, that's a Sunday afternoon, for the ribbon cutting ceremony for our next chapter capital campaign uh, completion project. But we will be moving uh, immediately to the atrium uh, after the lecture, and so questions that you have and conversation that you would like to have with John Paul can happen at that time. Now to give an official introduction to our featured speaker tonight, I want to call upon Dr. Raina Neufeld, Assistant Professor of Peace and Conflict Studies at Conrad Grable. Raina has had the distinct pleasure of working directly with Professor Lederach in several ways, first with Catholic Relief Services in 2000 in Washington, D.C. 
She recalls that she first really engaged the work of John Paul Lederach for practical field-based work when she was responsible for putting together training manuals for peace building, the contents of which were developed by Dr. Lederach. So for a more formal and important introduction, Raina. Thank you and good evening everyone, good to see you out here. It is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. John Paul Lederach tonight. He is, as has already been said, an internationally recognized peace building practitioner and a scholar whose pioneering work has really transformed the landscape of peace and conflict studies. John Paul is currently Professor of International Peace Building at the University of Notre Dame and he is a distinguished scholar at Eastern Mennonite University in Harrisonburg, Virginia. He is the founding director of EMU's Conflict Transformation Program, as well as its Associated Institute for Justice and Peacebuilding. And he is now also the director of the Peace Accords Matrix at the Koch Institute at Notre Dame. John Paul has written widely on conflict transformation, mediation, and peacebuilding. He has solo authored or co-authored 18 books and six training manuals. His works have been translated into 10 languages. His publications include Building Peace, Sustainable Reconciliation in Divided Societies, and The Moral Imagination, The Art and Soul of Building Peace, as well as the more recent one, When Blood and Bones Cry Out. John Paul has engaged in conflict transformation and peace building work in Nepal, Colombia, the Philippines, and Somalia, just to name a few of the many locations in which he's worked. He was here in Waterloo in the late 1980s when he was an MCC conciliator in Nicaragua and Costa Rica. And also now I understand also he might have been based in Pennsylvania for part of that time. At the time, John Paul was working with Ron Matthews and Ernie Regeer on some others from this area on the Horn of Africa project that a few of you might have some familiarity with. Three features distinguish John Paul's work in our field. First is a direct commitment to communities in conflict. And by direct, I mean very personal and being in communities and in situations of conflict. Secondly, you note in his work a distinct valuing of peace with justice, always a firm commitment to justice. And thirdly, a recognition of the centrality of relationships in transforming conflict. As a result of his work, scholars and practitioners have paid attention to and nurtured local efforts in leading peace and reconciliation efforts. John Paul's works are amongst the most frequently cited in peace and conflict resolution field textbooks. You see adaptations of his diagrams and figures in virtually every survey text in peace building and conflict resolution. More recently, he has provoked widespread conversation about the role of artistic creativity in peace building and the importance of moving beyond simply technical skills in order to achieve holistic change and build peace. I've had the privilege to watch John Paul weave stories and webs with peace building colleagues from Davao to Damango from the Philippines to Ghana. He has given life to and space for practitioners to find the artists within themselves and catalyzed their ability to imagine a future that transcends cycles of violence. He is not only a pioneer, but an inspiration. Tonight, we are honored to have him speak on one of his most recent projects, Compassionate Presence. Please join me in welcoming Professor John Paul Lederer. Justin, so you can hear my voice on the way. Right? Are you about right? Uh, let me say first a real word of thanks and gratitude to uh, Conrad Grable and to Susan in particular and Raina, who had to introduce me twice in the last three weeks. And we had a conference uh, in Toronto with the International Studies Association that she was also at. Um, this is a real privilege and an honor for me. I haven't been back to Grable since uh, the period of time that would have been roughly the early 90s when the Horn of Africa project was just initiated. And I'm looking around and seeing a number of familiar faces, so I will be eager to, uh, to catch up on people that I haven't had a chance to talk to for a while. You have also sent uh, out of this institution uh, a number of very important colleagues for us, and of course, a, a, 
a, a range of MA students that have graced our halls at Notre Dame and at EMU. Um, we, in particular, Lisa Shirk, who would trace some of her early education here. I think Larissa had some connection here at the, maybe at the undergraduate level and, and did some teaching in this area. Both uh, very, very fine colleagues. So it's a real privilege to be here. My uh, evening talk, tomorrow's uh, piece is, I think, more of the haiku version. It's around 10 or 12 minutes because the important thing is to get on to giving certificates to students that actually want to throw their hats off and do some shouting and celebration. Uh, but this evening, you're going to have to bear with me for about 40 minutes to an hour, depending on the, what I get caught up in when I start to tell stories. That's my problem. I start getting on stories and remind me of something else, and then there's nothing but stories that follow. And I am bringing to you some reflections uh, that have been bubbling for quite a few years. And they are hopefully taking the shape of a book. I thought this book was going to be out two years ago. But it just didn't come. Uh, because it didn't feel like that I had it quite right. So I've been doing more of this in my classroom teaching, more of this in some of the ways that I do um, lectures and conferences, so that I myself have opportunity to enter my own confusion. And I want to invite you into my confusion tonight. I think the best place we teach from is confusion. Now, that may sound very odd, but what it means is that you are in the active process of trying to sort through something that can't fully make sense. And what I've discovered after many years and decades of work in settings where there's been a lot of violence and a lot of conflict is that um, a lot of things don't make sense. And how people rise from, heal, even if it takes generations, um, is something I've come to respect deeply. So I've titled this tonight, Dispatches from the Burning Grounds, which I think will be the title of the book. Um, the subtitle has to do with both uh, compassionate presence, but also a faith-based or faith-inspired approach to peace building. And so parts of what I will share tonight are going to go across a number of themes. And I like to mention those because once I get started, you may or may not see that I'm following that scheme, but you at least know where I wanted to go when I started out. <laughs> so I'm going to start by telling you four stories. These are not the stories from the moral imagination, but they have a certain parallel. Uh, these stories I will call dispatches. A dispatch is something that's sent back from a place that is in some form of trouble, out to make announcements, to call attention to, to let it be known. And these uh, particular dispatches will have a, a slightly peculiar twist to them. I'm going to tell stories of situations that I found myself in. They're going to be short vignettes. And at the end of those, I will reach no conclusion. I will simply let you sit in the exact spot that I had to sit in. And I would ask you for just a few seconds that when that story is shared, you think for a moment how you might have responded. What might have come forward from your heart and soul in that moment. I would then like to do two or three comments um, some thoughts on the nature of violence, particularly direct, open violence, and the people that I've often had to accompany and work alongside of. And I'd like to make a few comments about faith-inspired peace building. Uh, the conclusion of this will come, be to come back to the topic of compassion. And I want to make a few comments about compassion, presence, and wholeness. And that's, my friend, where we're headed. So uh, let's hope the train leaves the station well. I'm going to start. Dispatch one I chose. I have uh, probably a dozen of these for the book. I've chosen three for tonight to start, and then one very personal one uh, to sort of enter into the topic. Dispatch number one, September 1987, Nicaragua. Anything else? 
the Minister of Interior was ending our meeting. Yes, I heard myself saying somewhat quietly, I have one more thing. The week before, I had received a message and a request that I had carried from Costa Rica to Nicaragua. Unwritten, the words were plastered on the sole of a very painful conversation. Only days before, one of the most significant, though quite controversial, revolutionaries, a defector from the Sandinista movement, had spent an evening in our home. He had heard the offers of amnesty that had been announced by the government. Exiles who wished to return, no matter their offense or status, would be accepted back without fear of reprisal. No legal or military reactions, as long as they put down all their weapons. <clears throat> Time has come to go home, this former revolutionary told me. But I have doubts they'll agree to let me come. There are, he paused for quite a while, mistakes, you know. No wounds worse than those received in the house of a friend. Can you ask him? Now I was standing before the powerful head of the Ministry of Interior, and I heard myself describe the conversation the person, and the request. Comandante, I said, he wants to come home, but he needs some assurance. Would you have something to tell him? Silence seemed to last longer than I could remember experiencing in this office that had become the space for negotiations and talking peace. Yes, the Comandante finally responded. You tell that son of a bitch that he will rot in the worst of all hells. The hell of nobody remembers you. Dispatch number two, January 9, 1993. Somaliland. In the distance, we could hear the rumbling din of a crowd as we left the airport and traveled in the back of a pickup truck into the outskirts of Hargeza. As we passed the edge of town, at times the noise seemed to grow, shouts and screams sounding more like a mob than a meeting. We had only a few details. We only knew it was dangerous. Fighting was about to break out. Our hosts were visibly shaken. Plans for the afternoon had changed. They spoke in low voices of some troubles with several local imams. By evening, the specifics emerged. Five women had been accused of adultery. No men were apparently caught in the act. On the heels of a brutal dictatorship and the disintegrating political chaos. Clan-based violence and warfare had given way to the sporadic rise of a far more fundamentalist expression of Islam, promising restoration of order than had ever been known in Somaliland. Our plane had touched down at the height of an impromptu court, making their way to the stoning grounds. High-pitched fervor carried the day. The women were buried to their necks, their heads just above ground. Crying for mercy, they begged to be heard, that they were not guilty. A young boy was given the first stone. Then clouds of rocks flew until the cries ended. Late that evening, a handful of women arrived at our host's house. 
It was risky to talk with foreigners, but they needed a sense of assurance, a connection to the outside. They retold the story in vivid detail, having watched from the edge of the crowd. Tears streamed down their faces. Fear reverberated in their shaking bodies. They pleaded for help. Dispatch 3, April 24, 1995, the Mays Prison, Northern Ireland. Be before you start, I have just one question. The commander looked around the room and then came back to full focus on his visitors. Why do you think violence doesn't work? This H-block commander took a seat across from us in his chair. We sat crunched on the underside of a bunk bed. Legs dangled just above me on the right. In a sparse room made for a couple of lifers, we had 15 pairs of eyes watching us. It was my first visit into the maze prison. Three mediators and a room full of loyalist paramilitaries. Creating an unusual break in their daily routine, but it made for an intense atmosphere. I felt a patch of breath wheezing inwards as I heard the question. We had barely arrived in the room and even spoken our names. I had the urge to turn to one or another of my two colleagues and say, why don't you take that question? When the commander's hand raised and drew a silence and all attention back on him, he was not finished. Before you answer, I have a story. A few months back, we had some troubles with the prison superintendent in here. <coughs> He didn't like some things we said and did. So one fine day, he decided that this year we would not receive our annual family Easter baskets. We found this totally unacceptable. We protested. We asked in writing for a change of policy. We asked for a meeting. We asked for negotiations. But nothing would change his mind. So we bid our time and we wait. Just prior to Easter, an opportunity presented itself. We grabbed a few of the guards when they opened the H block gate. We forced lock the gate. We took them to the back and into the showers. We stripped them naked and we beat them. We beat them, and then we threw them back out. The whole prison got shut down for a while. But our Easter baskets are back. They turned and looked me square in the eyes. Now tell me why you think violence doesn't work. Dispatch 4, May 1989, Washington, D.C. A personal story. I desperately needed to meet a couple of senators' aides on some policy issues related to Nicaragua. We were seven years into a long, slow negotiation to end the war in this Central American country. A first agreement had been signed, progress had been made, and our family had left the region to come back up to the United States. Over those years, I had expended thousands of hours of work, literally made hundreds of trips across multiple countries to carry messages and support the conciliation team 
mediating the negotiations between the East Coast Indians and the Sandinista government. And in the meantime, we had survived a threat to kidnap our daughter. I had received multiple death threats, had been caught in a mob intent on a good beating, which I did receive, and spent time under arrest accused of cocaine trafficking. That was in the mean time. Now I needed to make one last push on a couple of crucial issues. In peace building, there is always at least one critical and absolutely urgent issue needing immediate attention. I successfully navigated my two meetings grabbing a hot dog on the street on the way for lunch between senators' offices and the Capitol building. At the last meeting, I found myself itching my arm. And as I left the office, I went into the bathroom on the ground floor of the rotunda. I pulled back my sleeve, and I noticed that it was bright red with bumps. Bee sting, I thought. I must have been bitten. Then I noticed that my stomach itched, so I put myself in a bathroom stall and took off my shirt and saw the rashes falling up my body. And then I started to feel it on my neck. I pulled my collar down at the mirror, and it was emerging, and it was starting to restrict my breathing. I have to get out of here, I said. I have to get to an emergency room. Dashing out across the rotunda, I happened to run into my brother and sister-in-law, who were making a Washington visit with some high schoolers. I told them, take a look. They said, let's go. In a car we went and off to the emergency room. By the time I got there, I could barely talk. My throat was shutting down. I was having some kind of a severe allergic reaction. Steroids and anti-inflammatories. Two hours later, they released me on my own recognizance. It took a week for the rash to disappear. I took tests of every kind imaginable, but the episode remained, quotes, medically unexplained. With the exception that one doctor said, I may have had a reaction to the nitrites in the hot dog. I stopped eating hot dogs for five years. <laughs> it took me that long to have the courage to listen to a couple of inner voices that had been marginalized. The ones that were saying, hey dude, you're not allergic to hot dogs. You may be allergic to your work. Some of my inner community had thrown a coup. It happens when you don't listen, when you fall out of conversation with yourself. Those are my dispatches. Thoughts on violence. Over the past 30 years, I have witnessed, walked in and through, some very tough and bitter conflicts. Some of them you just heard small little pieces of conversations that would make up the aggregate total of those experiences. I have been in very close proximity and with people who suffered a lot and who have participated in violence. Recently, with my daughter Angie, we've written a book, one that was referenced as When Blood and Bones Cry Out, Journeys Through the Soundscape of Healing and Reconciliation. We were interested in the conversations that we had with people from communities that had repeated cycles of violence, taking note of the language that many people use to describe their situation and their process. 
we kept hearing <coughs> these kinds of phrases and words. When the loss came, I felt numb. I had no voice. I had no sense of home. I felt so lost. I don't know who I am. I am just trying to feel like a person again. We noted that it's interesting that the international community has a phrase for people who are forced removed from their home areas, but don't leave their home countries. And that phrase often goes by the initials IDP, which stands for internally displaced person or people. And we noted that there may be layers of metaphor that accompany that phrase. More often than not, it's used to say people who have been forced from their homes, but they remain inside of the boundaries of their country. That's an internally displaced person. If they cross the boundary into the next country or across numerous boundaries to another location <laughs> completely, they become refugees. So internally displaced people are within their own country. But the metaphor level that we found rather consistently in the language is that they felt deeply displaced internally. They had no sense of being able to locate their voice, their place. So here are a few thoughts on violence. Violence numbs. It numbs. So that you hardly have a feeling. The search to heal <coughs> is often a search to feel again. Violence uproots. It's the notion of displacement. The search to heal is a search to feel like you belong somewhere, that you belong again. Violence removes voice. It's a very common metaphor. Voice often has two levels of connotation. One level is we don't have a voice in the things they're doing, which means we are in the local communities too distant from the national peace process. We're left out. So voice in that case often refers to forms of power, who is in and who is out of discussions. But there's another way in which it removes voice, and it is the voice that I am no longer a person who is an author, who speaks, I am invisible, and I can't even find who I am. And here, healing has to do with recuperating a sense of personhood, of becoming an author and not a victim. Violence destroys humanity, and to heal is often about the process of rehumanizing. Violence destroys our capacity to feel and see beauty. To heal is to recapture a sense of awe and wonder and hope and to see beauty again. Maybe the most poignant description of this I've ever read came from Viktor Frankl, a book I imagine many of you have at one point or another read of his process of coming through and then out of the concentration camps in World War II. The particular incident to which I would refer in reference to this was the day that the prison gates were thrown open and everybody who had been in charge of the prison that he was in left. And he and other prisoners were not sure whether to walk out or to stay in. So the first afternoon, he said, I went out into the field next to the prison but I couldn't see or feel anything. So I went back in. This to me is absolutely riveting sharing that he does. I went back into that prison. In the next day, 
or two. I ventured back out, and one afternoon, I sat in the grass, and for the first time in years, I saw that the grass was green. And I heard a bird sing. And I sang incessantly a hymn from my childhood. And I cannot tell you how long I sat in that field. But when I stood, I felt like a person again. It was the beginning. So extraordinary that violence can remove our ability to feel and see beauty, to even notice that grass is green. You may have noticed in those little pieces that I mentioned that these are not just about journeys for those who are recuperating from violence, but it is about touching the essences of our great life journey, to feel like a person, to be whole, to belong, to stitch forward safety and love in a human family, a place to be in a community. Thoughts on faith and peace building. Peter Berger recently wrote uh, an article in which he said, described our globe as being a furiously religious world. Very interesting phrase. Furiously religious world. Truth is contested and defended. Fear of exclusion often drives a need for exclusivity. The notion that I find in a lot of places where religion is a part of the division. If your group prevails, if your truth prevails, ours will be eliminated. It's a full 100% complete win and loss. And there is a good bit of fear that accompanies that. And we notice that quite often around those fears, identities get shaped and bring us to an ever narrower and narrower expression of our conviction where it can only be expressed with those who believe exactly like we do. For any entry of something divergent could be the door that unleashes the prevailing of the other. We know in many of these contexts, and in fact, more broadly cast, we know that too much of our identity is constructed on knowing who we are not. Having the image of an enemy that provides a threat creates an internal sense of cohesion. Remove that image, remove that enemy, and things get unleashed internally that are no longer controllable. So how identity shapes in ways that move us toward narrow and narrower expressions is often the, diff the difficulty we face in a lot of locations. It is true, I think, that many despair of and disparage religion and faith. I have many colleagues that I work with from non-governmental organizations and from large bilateral and multilateral institutions who would take the viewpoint that we need to be agnostic in reference to religion. Religion opens the impossible. Much better to depend on rational thought for handling our differences. And it is true that religion is often the driver of violence, and it has enormous potential as a resource for peace. So since we are mostly among a Mennonite audience, and I'm a Mennonite, let me be confessional. It's a good thing to do occasionally. I suggest you not reserve it for Sunday mornings. I have more questions of my faith than when I started. I would say I am less certain 
of the certainties I had. Yet paradoxically, living in the faith of living in the face of violence has deepened my faith in very concrete ways, mostly from the inspiration I have drawn from people who have navigated situations far more difficult than any I have ever seen. I don't see the fact that I have less certainty to mean that I have less faith. For me, faith is not about quantity or certainty. It's about essence. I would call it the haiku thing. I talk to some of the students today about haikus. It's that core little thing. I think Jesus called it the mustard seed. So here are a few mustard seeds that have been meaningful for me as guideposts of a person who has a faith basis and a faith inspiration for engaging in peace building. Guidepost one, when you are with people of other faith traditions, and even with those who have no faith tradition, offer what you hope to receive from others, honesty and transparency. If you don't know what those words mean, it means this, just be yourself. Second, be open and be curious. Know that truth unfolds endlessly. Prepare to peer into your own deepest understanding of truth by way of windows offered in the lives, understanding, and experiences of others. Number three, deep truth search and sharing cannot be done on a one-off exchange. It requires trust. Trust comes with friendship. Friendship comes with time. It's the roomy thing. So if you permit me, let me cite a wonderful Sufi poet, Persian poet. Out beyond our ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. We repeat that first line. Out beyond ideas of wrongdoing and rightdoing, there is a field. I'll meet you there. When the soul lies down in that grass, the world is too full to talk about. Ideas, language, even the phrase each other doesn't make sense anymore. Deep truth search is finding a way to that field. So here's the guidepost. The single greatest gift you can give yourself in this life of a faith journey is to create a lifetime friendship with someone who does not believe like you. Not a one-time conversation. Not an interreligious tourism gig. A lifetime friendship where you can be, as my friend from Tajikistan once said, you can have enough trust to talk truth. And if you have different truths, you have enough trust to stay friends. Fourth guidepost. Share faith when asked. And listen to the other as if God is about to speak to you personally. Try that one on for size. Listen to the other when you have a sense that the person speaking is like God speaking to you, no matter the source. And I think St. Francis had it right. Speak always to the love of God. 
Use words if you must. Thoughts on compassion, presence, and wholeness. I want to start these few final reflections on compassion and presence with one last short description of a personal dispatch. It came 10 years after the blessed hot dog. The blessed hot dog was the moment that took me five years to know it, um, that maybe I hadn't been listening to myself very well. But there was an inner world to peace building, as well as an outer world of peace building. In 1998, a decade later, I was in a car accident in the Basque country. It was a near-death experience. Late night, traveling from Madrid into Donosti, where we were to meet people around the Basque conflict. Uh, the driver was going 140 kilometers an hour. An accident happened way out ahead of us that backed up an exit, came out onto the main highway, and we hit the back of a stopped lorry truck going 140 kilometers an hour. <clears throat> In that particular moment, the seat belt ripped. I was in the back seat. It ripped exactly the line that it was on my chest. And I broke almost every rib that I have. The ones on my left side crisscrossed like crucifixes. That was what the doctor told me when I could eventually hear again. I remember laying in a ditch, trying to catch my breath. Because when you have your ribs crush, your lungs collapse and there's no air in there. I don't know if any of you ever had the experience of a time where you got hit and you, you lost your breath, so to say, maybe a plane or something, and you have that panic of trying to suck in air and it won't come. I won't go into all the details. I will say that that's where I met Bob Dylan at the pearly gates. Now you have to buy the book to hear that part of the story. <laughs> what it did do was it stopped me dead in my tracks hospitalization, months of complete dependence on others, then a slow winding and unwinding process of physical recuperation, and a lot of soul searching. That particular time period of about five to six months, I became aware, as I had never been aware before, of my own fragile and precious humanity. I don't know, I do meditating practices now, usually in the mornings. If any of you have ever done that, you know that it starts by focusing on your breath. And I don't know if you have ever done two things, because I do them on a regular basis since this time period. They're just simple subconscious things that I now are part of my very being. The first thing I do is I remind myself that every breath I take is a new breath. I've never breathed this one before. It's a new breath. It's a gift. And on occasion when I remember, I say thank you to my lungs. I don't know when it was the last time you might have said thank you to your lungs. <laughs> but I have come to the place where I say thank you to my lungs. I experienced in those months moments of compassion, love, and care in how people held and provided for me. From a night nurse who went the extra mile, or my wife Wendy's unending patience and encouragement throughout the recovery. Some days I dipped so low I lost sight of everything. Minutes felt like years. For days and weeks and even months, I had nowhere to go except inside. I experienced an overwhelming sense of powerlessness. I had no control over anything. I felt things I could not express. Words failed me. I had fallen into the world of the unspeakable. And this precipitated a period of deep questions. 
some about my profession, some about personal life. The amazing thing is that it's been 15 years, 15 years since that accident. And the questions have not gone away. Because they're questions without answers. They're about life. They're about vocation. They're about my place in the world. I find I listen differently to students now. Students often come to my office. I make my office hours now walking hours. I prefer to go on walks with students. And as we walk, particularly if we're going outside and we're doing a walk, inevitably they come with a question about a concept, a theory, an approach, an initiative. And behind the question comes the real agenda. And when it comes, it starts to spill out in the direction of big questions. Who am I? How do I fit in? Where am I going? What difference will I make? Where do I belong? And I've just noticed over the years how in my early years of teaching, I didn't have much time to get to those questions because the concern was the content. But the transformative part was about curiosity and care and compassion and presence. Compassion for me arrived by way of people who had their hearts in their hands, angels who in moments of urgent need noticed that I was there. They responded to something I needed and could not provide on my own. And in that, I experienced that the act of doing had a far more important element. It was an ineffable sensation of connection, embedded in the somewhere and the somehow of who they were as people. I still have few words to express this. The best I can offer is this. I sensed their presence. And I sensed them sensing my humanity and holding it with care. This I experienced as something deeply sacred. And I kept saying, I'm noticing angels all around me for the first time in my life. When I returned to the writing, the teaching, and the practice of peace building, I started carrying this deeper inquiry with me. I wanted to know what was below and beyond the doing and the responding. The quality of presence. What is the quality of presence that we embody that creates the ripples of sacred sensing? of mutual humanity. It got to me enough that I started some research. I started with a colleague, an initiative to look at compassion, creativity, and spirituality across five bodies of writing. Here are the five bodies. Neuroscience, artists, helping professions, contemplative traditions, and peace building. You know, neuroscientists, they're, they're an intriguing crew of people. They're in a studying now Tibetan contemplatives. And they're studying musicians. They're putting them in MRI machines, you know, a Tibetan meditator. 10,000 hours of meditation. And in the early days, they put on this big elaborate thing on the head of the Tibetan meditator to know what happened in their brain when they were meditating and it increased their ability for compassion? And the Tibetan would look at them and say, why are you putting this on my head? And they said, we want to study compassion. They said, you put it on the wrong part of the body. <laughs> so their view was compassion was in the gut, not the head. This, by the way, is not far off from those, I'm sure Tom studying Greek and Hebrew would know that the Greek when the, the instances where it is said that Jesus was moved by compassion, the actual literal translation is a long Greek word I can't pronounce. 
that says he was moved in his guts. His guts moved. In Hebrew, Rahim, there is a sense that it is in the womb. Marcus Borg, the theologian, says that compassion is actually very closely connected to notions of the womb. The earliest place any of us experienced compassion was being held in that way, surrounded, only hearing the heartbeat, only the first vibrations of life that were the fullness of what we had in that experience. There isn't a single one of you that didn't experience that. It's in there. It's in the womb. Well, this is very close to the Tibetan view. Put the study down here. You're headed the wrong direction. We looked in professional helpers. We looked in artists. The biggest single thing I took away was this observation. Of all the areas that wrote about compassion, the one that wrote the least about compassion was peace building, with one exception. And that exception was our Asian colleagues from Buddhist tradition. Thich Nhat Hanh, you could, Dalai Lama, you could go down the list of books that you would read about compassion where they're also involved in peace building. And for them, of course, those two words are almost synonymous. They make little or no separation. They don't enter much of the mainstream of peace building literature because it's seen as a bit peripheral, wouldn't it be? But I was struck by my own view that many of us came into this field motivated by compassion, but we didn't write about it. We didn't bring it fully into classes. So this led to some observations and the reason why I'm having difficulty getting this book out. I'm trying to sort through, in part, how I understand this. And one of the ways I come to understand it is that as a peace builder, as a person, we have within us, our identity is shaped by a DNA. That's what carries the identity by which we're created. The DNA has a double helix. You've ever seen the image? Double helix that kind of is rotating. And between the two sides of the helix, there are little connecting points that go back and forth as that shapes. Some beautiful images of this that are more recently developed through a kind of photography that MRI imaging permits us to do. And I think the DNA of a peace builder is this, a skilled professional and a healthy person, healthy personhood. But I notice that most of what we do is to help develop the professional and skill-oriented preparation. Analysis of conflict, conflict transformation approaches, strategic peace building, mediation, conciliation. We can define terms, we can study schools of thought, we can teach skills. And that comprises the large, overwhelming proportion of what we do. The inner side, healthy personhood, the inner works of peace building, wholeness, recognition of personal need, ego, gift and shadow, care for self, is often seen as something that is the responsibility of the person to figure out. And often it's not figured out until you've reached the place where it's like my blessed hot dog. Burnout. The two big expressions of this that I find with many of my professional colleagues who work for long periods of time in settings of open violence is either a form of intensive work that leads to burnout and a transfer laterally to something totally different, or a form of professional apathy in which we deliver the technical goods for the benefit of the community, but we don't want to involve ourselves too much because too much is too much, isn't it? We have, I think, a capacity to produce program templates for doing peace building, 
but we have little capacity to hold the mapping of the inner soul. And when I talk about dispatches, you may have noticed that some of the dispatches were coming from situations of enormous suffering and pain. And some of the dispatches were sent up from my soul, sent up from the very source of my being. And both of those represent the burning grounds. They represent the burning grounds. I think when the hot dog came, and then the car accident came, decade apart, it was in part a gift to say, listen, pay attention, notice. What I have been developing since that time was incorporating <laughs> ever more into the way that I teach and the way that I work with groups. <laughs> Elements that permit us to open the difficult world of conflict and the equally difficult world of our inner experiences. What I could recall, what I could call in one recent publication, the unfolding of the human spirit. I have landed on three, although this is not conclusive, and every time I give it, I change the names. But I've landed on three titles to chapters that are part of this book. I'm just going to give you the chapter titles with brief description, and then I'll move to the conclusion. I think compassion requires us to enter with a viewpoint that these are like compassion arts. It's like the fine arts. These are <coughs> compassion arts. And the three that I think are key, the first is to notice. And it's the art of seeing our mutual humanity. The art of seeing each other as human beings. Now, I can't tell you how difficult that is when you're sitting across from the commander. I can't tell you how difficult it was sitting across from Mohammed Aidi in Mogadishu when there were two and a half million people dying of starvation and he was lecturing me about bringing him more weapons because the international community had to respond to the need of Somalia. I can't tell you how much it is difficult to look in that eye and find something of yourself and of God embedded in there because we tend to see ourselves as better and superior. But I do know that there is much of Muhammad ID to me as there is in him. I do know that when that commander in that prison asked me whether I thought violence worked, this was not a conversation about violence and nonviolence. <coughs> the commander was asking a different question, and that question could only be opened up with some form of seeing our mutual humanity. And the question was, who am I? Who are you? Who are we going to be? I could have argued until I was blue in the face about the preferential option for nonviolence for social change. That wasn't what he was asking. He was speaking from a place in his soul that said, I have suffered and I have chosen. And if you're coming here to be superior to me, I don't want this conversation. If you're willing to be here as a person with me, beyond our right doing and our wrong doing, there is a field. How do we get to that field? Where we begin with the notion that we are human beings. To notice, I think, is the increasing the capacity to be fully present in a moment where you recognize the great gift of humanity, no matter who you're with. And if we don't develop the eyes to notice, we plow through life with a toolkit of skills and never see people. And that's not the kind of peace building I'm interested in. The second is to befriend. And I think it's the art of staying in touch. I had a wonderful mentor in my early years in the conciliation service who was an elderly Quaker mediator from 
London. His name was Adam Curl. A few of you may have had an opportunity to meet him. He did some lecturing in the latter part of his years traveling here to Canada and other places. Uh, he was involved up into his 90s. He traveled, I don't know how many times in his 90s, to Sarajevo during the siege. He was a mediator, conciliator, the only one that I've ever found that said his work as a mediator could principally be defined as befriending. He befriended people on different sides of a conflict. Now, most of the mediation field moves quickly toward definitions of, of impartiality, neutrality. We've kind of debunked that a bit now. Uh, equidistance. I mean, it's one of the big phrases in mediation. We keep an equidistance from both sides. He, and here comes this elderly Quaker guy who says it's about befriending. And you don't make friendships instrumentally. You don't make a friendship in order to get somewhere else. If you're making a friendship, it's because you want to be friends. And friends, I think, are about the process of staying in touch. Now, when I use that phrase, the art of staying in touch, I think it's about being in contact with people's everyday experience, really getting deep, having the trust to talk truth. But I also think that the hardest friendship to create is the one that requires you to befriend yourself. To know what it's like to have a conversation with your own self. The inner world of things that are happening with you. To recognize your patterns. When I became ill, it was in part, I said, because I fell out of conversation with myself. And I think that is one of the biggest things that we have a challenge to sort through. How to create the space that people can stay in touch deeply with a sense of their own person. The third one is to accompany. And accompany is one that we've used a long time, I think, in a lot of the um, Mennonite Central Committee work and other activities that we've done. I refer to it as the art of alongsideness. That, by the way, if you type it in, is not a word in Google. Uh, word programs and stuff. They, they'll tell you to change it, make it different. I just go on and leave it there. I, I like the word alongsideness. Alongsideness means that you're not ahead preparing the way for someone else. And you're not behind pushing, but that you are alongside at the pace that people are moving. And that piece of it, walking side by side, I think is, is a big piece of the compassion pit. It's the ability to come alongside of and to stay with that conversation, that pace, and that friendship. A company, of course, compan in Latin is to share bread. So it has more of a bread table metaphor to it. Well, alongsideness has that same, but it also has the notion of traveling and that we are a part of a journey that carries us together. Those three things, by my view, are key to the compassion arts. The art of seeing our mutual humanity, the art of staying in touch, befriending, and the art of alongside us. So let me conclude with these few thoughts. Inevitably, peace building for me has exposed me to very demanding egos and often quite damaged souls. People who are seeking meaning and voice in the midst of violence. Sometimes they assert their needs in forms that become very abrasive with anger, blaming, it often rises from places of insecurity and fear and pain. If the arts of compassion are present, you don't find yourself hooked by the anger or the bitterness or the blame. But you find yourself interested in knowing how to come alongside the person that's trying to speak from a place that has been hard. 
Peace building places us in very close proximity with a significant amount of suffering and trauma. And I have noted how easily we can carry secondary forms of trauma because of close relationships we have. And how we navigate that world, how we bring it where we are fully present but not overtaken is really one of the biggest challenges that I think we face. So I have noted this in my life. Damaged egos and trauma touch and affect both my spirit and my soul. And if I am incapable of being in conversation with my own spirit and soul, I will have the allergic reactions of too many hot dogs. <laughs> Compassionate presence and peace building requires that we cultivate the resilience to courageously face the outpouring of ego in the midst of conflict without replicating its anxious dynamics. That we nurture the listening heart to live alongside deep trauma without taking over responsibility for healing of others. In both instances, compassionate presence suggests a commitment to alongside this that provides a different quality of presence in our relationships. This quality of presence requires open vulnerability, but not gullible weakness. Boundless love with clarity of boundaries. Listening for the fragile voice of truth and choosing to live by that truth without arrogance or imposition. I think it requires us to listen and come alongside the dispatches that are rising from the burning grounds, whether they are external or internal. Thank you again for this opportunity and this evening. John Paul for uh, these, these tremendous stories, stories uh, born in brokenness, uh, but in many cases ending in great beauty, stories of crisis and creativity and uh, compassion. Um, you give us a new inspiration to think of one of the values that we hold dear here at Conrad Grable, compassionate service, uh, and its accompanying part, community building, and, and giving us stories from the heart uh, to understand that. Uh, you can see the kind of teacher he is and uh, how he has been a, uh, uh, a consummate teacher at the University of Notre Dame and at Eastern Mennonite University. Uh, let's thank him again uh, for this wonderful evening and then uh, we will uh, move to the atrium and have some treats and be able to uh, uh, receive him there as well. Thank you again, Jean-Paul. Thank you.